Okay, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get the um, let me get the book up, and we can go ahead and get started. So, Dortier um, last week got about halfway through the um, chapter four, and we talked about um, clustering and the different methods to do that. So, we kind of we went into like Euclidean distance versus uh, Manhattan distance, um, doing hierarchical clustering, which is important for like if you're doing like gene expression data. Um, so we did that. We did um, hierarchical versus k-means and like different ways to do that. So the next, the second half of this is actually doing PCA and other like um, dimension reduction things like TSNE. Um, just a really good way to like begin to explore data. And I'm sure, uh, Frederica, you could probably explain it better than I can from a statistical standpoint, but I'm going to do my best. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. I don't have, so Dorothy, I was supposed to do this today, so I don't have the slides prepped, but I can, we can definitely go over it. Um, Y'all see my, um, the book screen for it should be yep. good. Yep, perfect, okay. So um, essentially when you've got a bunch of different um, variables that you're trying to analyze, you we don't, you know, as humans, we can't see beyond 3D. So you have to be able to reduce all of these dimensions into something that we can actually visualize. And the, probably the main way that we do that is the principal component analysis. And the best way that I can describe it in like a one sentence summary is when you have your, um, you've got all these different dimensions and then the data are, um, each data for each dimension is essentially plotted on a line um, that can then be transposed um, into two dimensions. And you do that over and over for every single dimension that you have for basically, you know, every gene or every factor that you're trying to compute. Um, all those are put together in the eigenvalues. And then those values are then transposed onto a two dimensional graph. And that's how you get the clustering. That's my very, very uh, high level overview of it. Um, and it's actually, when you look at how it's actually done, it's really not that complicated from a, um, theoretical standpoint, but, um, it can look a little bit overwhelming. So for the example that they give here, um, they're looking to, um, this example is showing two different genes to look at for the expression um, and to see how they differ between um, the two genes within this data set of like different um, leukemia um, types of cancer. Um, and so they plotted the two genes and if you're just looking at the plot right now, it's like, okay, well, this doesn't mean anything. Can you see if this were to have the color change so you could see the individual like um, the types of cancer they're grouped in, you know, maybe you could see some clustering like that. Um, that's from that. Um, so in a principal component plot, um, the way that the data are presented, which I think they've got, yeah, the example down here. So this is like how they were plotting the genes. And then down here was they actually looked to show the um, differences, like with the different types of cancer and then the expressions of the two genes, and then they start to do the clustering of that. But essentially what I'm talking about here on the, the right side, a principal component plot explains it in, uh, when you're looking at this graph, um, you're not looking to see the, um, the exact value of how things are changed, but you're looking to see the mm -hmm. amount of um, difference between the groups that can be explained by each component and the graph traditionally represents the first two components um, that give the most weight to how the variance, how the differences can be explained between the groups. And so the first component um, having the most weight in terms of explaining the differences and then the second component has the least of the second amount. And then um, there's multiple components that are available that are, are used to explain the dimension, like the differences between groups. But they, uh, you can only show, you know, on a plot like this too, you could maybe do three um, if you did an XYZ graph, but 
you only have two to start. So, um, a quick question on that. Um, yeah. If we're looking at that chart on the right, um, mm -hmm. how would you like, how would you explain it? So would you say the red group, which is AML, um, mm -hmm. differs from the blue group, uh, which is no leukemia? Um, it differs most in component one. Is that how you would kind of talk through that graph? I would say here that they would actually differ more in component two. So like uh, in terms of like the X axis, they're both at about the same spot, but in component two, um, you have the AML group that's higher up than the um, component two. Group. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I was so I would say, no, no <laughs> yeah. it's all good, it's all good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so they're basically, and again, the principal component plot doesn't tell you how they're different. It just explains like, that they are different and like some dimension is explaining most of the difference and then the next dimension is explaining the other difference or, or not the other difference but like the next most important difference so in this particular example here the second component um does more to explain between the um the, the cml and the no uh, i think the no cancer is the that light blue Mm -hmm. I can't remember if it was leukemia, leukemia and lymphoma. Yeah, leukemia. And then the AML is explained more for that. But in terms of the first component, you see that the difference is more in the CLL group and the ALL compared to the AML and the CML and the no cancer. So that, like that dimension yeah. is explaining um, that part. And I'm going to drop a link in. There's um, a guy on YouTube. Um, his name is Josh Stammer, who's actually a um, a biostatistician um, at UNC, and he does really, really great videos of explaining um, this stuff like super clearly in like a in a less um, technical and just a more of a um, theoretical. Uh, just understanding the theory behind it and it's I think super helpful and it can definitely explain it better than I can ever attempt to do on this but um no worries I yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, I really enjoy his um videos and it really helps to explain it so I just put the one in for the PCA cool doing that but um yeah so without trying to like read through it but essentially the original data yeah the points of variance and you have multi you can have the first component is like the most variance and the second is um, the next amount. And again, you can have multiple things of that. In terms of doing it in R, um, it's um, just handled with actually a pretty simple, like in base R at least, um, just doing the print comp function and it'll um, perform it. And then you can plot what that is. Um, so yeah, can we walk through that, the R code? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, let me go ahead and pull up my, um, let me just get a new file going. I can't, I don't know where I put that other one um, that I, I worked through the examples from the book. Um, and on in the book chapter, they've got the, the, uh, they, they, they claim they had the answers. They had the answers for chapter three, but most of the answers are not filled in for the rest of the exercises. However, when I was going through it, most of the questions from the chapter were just actually explained in the context of the book. So, oh. yeah. So I'm going to put this. Yeah. I'm going to let me, this computer's really slow. Can y'all see my um, R console, the R Studio console right now, or is it only showing my um, the book screen? I see the R Studio. Okay, perfect. So going back to this example, so we're gonna actually I need to pull up the data set. You'll give me like 
two minutes. I'm going to try digging again. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I, I had all of this worked out, and I just need to remember where it got hood, which is unfortunate because I, yeah, no yeah, I, did this on Mon- <laughs> I did this on Monday, and I apologize. I got in a little late this morning, <laughs> so like I couldn't prep as well as I would have liked to um, for this. I think, Alison, uh, we can just keep going uh, as you were doing it. That was great. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, let me, um, yeah, we'll go back and we'll, uh, Lance, we'll yeah, go through yeah, and we'll do me. the um, yeah. example. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, don't want to waste any more time. Okay, so. Um, going back to the PCA analysis. Um, Do you want to like share said, your screen like, again? Yep. Yep. All right. Oh, wait. Wrong one. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Um, so going back to the um, the PCA example. Um, so we've calculated the um, the transformation of the values into these things that are called the eigenvectors and then plotting them onto um, the graph. And then you can also um, um, something called a scree plot is what they actually use to, so as I said, like the, this graph is only gonna show a couple different dimensions. It's not showing everything. Um, but the scree plot is what actually demonstrates um, and shows how much variance is explained by each dimension. And so it's a, essentially just a bar graph and it starts off with like the most, um, the most of the variance explained in the first and then the, little, the second most in the second and the third. So it's, it's, it's gonna look something like this if we've got, the most here than here and it's just as each component that um, less and less of the variance is explained by later components and so um, this is what the screen plot would show um, and it's useful especially if you've got something that if you're not really having your um, expression being um, interpreted in just like the two components or like if you have a very limited amount of uh, variance being explained by different um, by the first few components. This scree plot can be useful for that information. Like if you've got a scree plot that looks more like um, this, that you would have as opposed to having a lot of variance explained in the first and second component, and then like decreasing like that. If you've got kind of an equal distribution of variance, um, this would indicate that it's a little bit more um, like the um, the variance between the samples and discerning differences is a little bit um, more difficult to explain. It's not as easily um, uh, shown, essentially. Um, so uh, this is when the screen plot can be useful for that. Um, it's not simply something that's like presented. It's more of a tool to be able to demonstrate, or not to demonstrate, but to be able to interpret your data further if you're not really satisfied with the um way that your pca plot is looking and you want to see okay like why am i only getting like 10 percent of the variance explained by these two components you may have just a bunch of components that all equally contribute to and so uh, that would indicate that your data aren't really um able to be ex like the differences between the groups cannot be explained through this type of reduction technique and so there might be need to be other um techniques that are used um, to do that. And so they, um, there's different ways to calculate PCA and there's other kind of like dimension, sorry, um, singular value. I mean, oh goodness. Um, other so, uh, dimensions. Real quick with that. Techniques. Yeah. Um, real quick with that, the screen plot function. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm just uh, rereading this. So it sounds like um, yeah. it takes the output of the um, PR comp function. Yeah. Um, 
So I'm just trying to th- think through like how you, how you do that in R. Um, would you just, as arguments, would you just put those functions in as arguments to the screen plot function? Yeah, and they, um, I think they do that. Let me scroll a sec, because I'm pretty sure they make a screen plot later on with this. You could oh, control okay. F for, for screen plot too. Yeah. Yeah. I might have it in the X or something. You know, I think. Yeah, I have. Because oh, I had all of this on here and I don't know where I put that. Um, that's okay i was just wondering actually, if you might be able, yeah yeah but it's it's something that like you um put it in and it's yeah it's just a function that like it's so the example here that they have um back to this chapter um where they have this matrix like the data um for the example that they use is just in the it's just a data frame that's labeled mat for this for this matrix and so um they are doing the principal component of the once they've um scaled everything to make it um evenly distributed or like e- evenly um valued between the two genes for this they um they scaled that and then they use that scaled data to perform the principal component analysis, just labeled PR. And then you could just do like screen plot um, PR. And then that would give you um, the, the screen plot data. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, and I'll, when I um, get a chance later this weekend, I will update this chapter. I'll like get on the, um, I'll pull the GitHub repository for it, and I will update this with like work through examples. I just don't have it for today at the moment, um, so that way um, we can, you know, it's available there to show it. Um, so going back through this, um, and they were talking about the the other way to perform PCA. Um, this concept called singular value decomposition. Um, Essentially, it's just a different algorithm as opposed to um, it's just a different way to get the eigen um, eigenvectors. And I heard it correctly, like you could explain this statistically a little bit better than I could. Um, but essentially, um, you are instead of taking a row, like a vector of the um, here on the right, instead of taking an entire um, row of values, you're literally just taking a single value to plot this. So instead of reducing it to um, a set, um, you are reducing it to like, like in, in this camp example, if I'm understanding this correctly, you would be, instead of taking the row in this case would be like the particular type of cancer and doing that for each type of cancer instead of doing that you're doing that for um each individual data point within that type and then taking those data points together to create a singular value so instead of average you know taking it all together as one as a group you're taking each point individually and then grouping it to kind of the reverse of um, the other method that was explained. And this is typically the more common method because you have the ability to, um, each value is given its own weight as opposed to just like the group itself as a whole giving the weight. And so this um, gives it um, a little more, I wouldn't say credence isn't really the right word, but um, outliers, would not necessarily would have less of a weight on the group as a whole using the singular value decomposition as opposed to um, generating a eigenvector 
um, or an eigenvalue for the group as a whole because the the weight would be different. Is that Frederica? Is that a correct explanation yeah. of how I interpreted that? Okay. Yeah, basically they, they are uh, they they want to um, um, it's it's a matrix uh, it's a matrix multiplication. So mm -hmm. you basically want to the, the green the green matrix, the X uh, matrix you want to achieve uh, from, from one matrix you uh, you use uh, the, the components and so these components are multiplied within them so the u s and v are the components of the x matrix okay For, uh, mm -hmm. you use them uh, and to to make the x matrix okay so and to obtain the x matrix you can like manipulate um the, this um to make the calculation easier using a single value matrix which is the the one on, in the center okay so basically you use this uh, which has just the value on the the main um, um, uh, you see you uh, on, on the, the, the diagonal you have the values just on the diagonal in the s mm -hmm. matrix so you basically use this to transform uh, and be able to multiply uh, uh, the the, um, the matrices, okay? Uh, because sometimes mm -hmm. it might be difficult. So the, basically, very very easy explanation for the reason uh, for which you do all the all these things is get, is just that it's easier to make the to the multiplication, okay? Because you you can imagine you have. Uh, uh, um, a, a, a big matrix of numbers, and then you want mm -hmm. to like transform this this matrix in a way that you you like you have an equation uh, like uh, y equals to m x. So the, like like the, the the simple equation is imagine if you, if you want to obtain x from uh, okay. You need to transform and pass the the elements on the other side of the equation sign. So, and when you do these things within with matrices and so a large amount of numbers, you need to do like a bit of tricks. And uh, using um, a singular value matrices matrix, it's it's helpful. So in a way that you because uh, the actually the uh, how can I say the um, uh, so to multiply matrices, you basically uh, sum the column of numbers and then multiply the result of the sum of the the, the, the column for the first element in the singular value uh, decomposition. Then the result that you obtain will be multiplied to the B matrix, okay, and so on. Mm -hmm. for, for all the elements. In fact, you have one, two, three, four, five elements in the singular value, which are the same number of uh, rows in the art. So you need like, um, it's, a, it's a, like a, a little trick, but it is a matrix it's a multiplication thing. Okay. Yeah, it's just another way of getting the same. Yeah, yeah. Um, Good news, I did find my uh, chapter four code. I knew I did it, I just had it saved in the wrong location. Um, so um, when we finish going through um, the chapter, we can go through and we can look at actually doing this, um, these examples in R. Um, so I'll try to get through the rest of the chapter real quick so we've got some time to actually look through it. So, um, and if you look, compared to the, um, if we're going up to this first graph of doing the C composition, you see some separation between the um, CML and the null leukemia group, and then the AL, AML group is kind of different from the ALL and the CLL, for the most part, but if you transpose it with this method, um, you can actually I see some more clear um, delineation between the 
each of the individual groups between these two genes. So um, using different techniques, you know, will give you different results. And it's, you know, up to us as doing the, in the, doing the bioinformatics and the biostatistics behind that to choose the best interpretation um, or, you know, looking at the different methods to be able to decide um, which one best explains the data that you're seeing. Um, so, and, and then the difference, it, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, so the difference between these two plots that you're showing, that the one above and then this one is just the function mm -hmm. that they used, right? So in the first one they used, uh, was it PRIN comp? And then in this one, it was just uh, PR comp? Um, so the way that they did it, they scaled the data um, a little bit differently. So they did the... Um, oh, single, the SVD. Oh, okay. So yeah, that's that's the difference. The the PR comp or the PRIN comp, it's... it's I guess, like you're gonna still get that, yeah, but it's the way that the data are treated before they're plotted, gotcha. and like before they're okay. doing the principal component. Yeah, um, and then in those plots, is that basically like showing the same thing, like uh, component one on the x-axis and then component two on the y? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um. And so yeah, you get the different results and there's other ways. Um, the latent factor interpretation is something I'm not um, super familiar with. Um, but again, it's another method to um, calculate your eigenvalues and your eigenvectors to be able to get your um, gene interpretation. So essentially all at the end of the day, um, you know, you've got these different methods to be able to explain you can use to attempt to explain the variance in your data. Um, and as they succinctly put here, um, if you need to not to care about biology, you know, it's up to us to be able to understand that we have different tools at our disposal to be able to interpret the data. Um, so, and then, um, so principal component analysis is one method of doing it. There are other um, dimension reduction techniques that also um, give a similar result, but again, it's just a different way to do it. Um, so again, I, this is something that got me a little confused. I'm not entirely sure of the difference between the independent component analysis and the principal component analysis. Um, Frederick, do you uh, have any insight into that? I'd like just to, to say that, for example, the, the principal components um, helps you to uh, identify the, the variance of uh, within your data so like the mm -hmm. variation and it when uh, uh, you calculate the principal component with the function there's different function that you can use here they, they use that function but you, you have uh, other ways to, to make principal component and um, uh, what what's happening is that they uh, you you set the number of, of components that you want you set the a threshold like uh, the the percentage of variance that you would like to pull out from your principal component analysis for example you can set it like eighty percent of your variance that you want to see uh, how the your data group uh, with um, within 80% uh, of variance, for example. So they, the, the function basically what does is that uh, select, the, uh, divide your data within five groups, and then uh, to build up these groups, uh, choose the elements which uh, have the highest uh, variance and build the first group then the second level of variance and the second group and so on within to, to to, to reach the number of groups necessary for uh, showing you the, the percentage of variance that you uh, want to see. You can even set it to 100%. You might need 80 components, no? Uh, okay. So, yeah, and then, then what you see, you see your data group it, and then you can see that they are um, uh, uh, basically, your your data behaves in a way that uh, those groups uh, have similar variance. Okay. Okay. So then, then, then you 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 can speculate and say 
um, how the, those things can evolve. Okay. Then there is mm -hmm. this, uh, this other independent component analysis, which uh, is because there, there's uh, like supervised and unsupervised analysis that you can do. Right. So this one here is quite similar. And so you, 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 if you go through, I'm sure that you, you, you find, but then, then uh, the, there is a little difference, but they, they are quite similar. But the principal component is the most popular one because it's focused on variance. And mm -hmm. this, yeah, so. Um, and then the in, yeah. yeah, and the independent component analysis is looking more um, not so much at the variance, but just like the, um, I'm still trying to like, okay, so they're looking at like the um, expression profiles as a whole, meaning like how each part constitutes the difference within itself. Yeah, I might um, I'll have to look more into that. But yeah, I think PCA, like you said, is like, that's the important one to really understand. And then um, I, this is one I hadn't heard of before today, the non-negative matrix um, factorization. I, it seems that, you know, the way that they're going through this, go ahead. Be helpful, sorry if I interrupt you. Uh, you can have a look at tidy models uh, with our book. Okay, if mm -hmm. it's online, it's here available and everything. And there is a chapter, obviously, is the, the is tidy models techniques to make models and everything. So it's not bioconductor, it's, you have other functions. But there is a nice explanation within this. Uh, the, there is a chapter, dimensionality reduction, because I've read the book a couple of times. So now I have this in mind. Uh, okay. And you can have a look at the chapter, uh, dimensionality reduction, tidy model reduction. Uh, th there are um, th all these, these techniques that are all mentioned, and you can find like uh, mm, little little uh, more uh, like insights about that. Yeah, I put the. Okay. I put it, the you put what? Oh, we can't I'm hear you. Oh, sorry. I put the link. Huh? For the chapter in the in uh -huh. the chapter. Oh, great. Okay, in the um in the Slack channel. Oh no, sorry. Oh. Uh, maybe my my headphones are not good. I, I said in the chat. <laughs> I put in the chat. Oh, in the chat. Okay, I haven't. We haven't gotten it yet, or I haven't seen it yet. Oh no, 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 I didn't put it yet. Aha, there you yeah, thank you. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, this is, um, yeah, I think this might help explain um, the, the statistical stuff they go into in this, in the um, computational genomics book is um, very technical, which is great to like really understand the theory behind it, but it's, you know, not coming from a statistical background. It's a little um, difficult to really um, get into it. Um, and understand it. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so essentially the rest of this chapter is going into um, the different ways of scaling. So um, at the end of the day, it's all just different techniques to, again, get your um, explaining the variance between the different um, vectors. And so the same, I mean, the different groups. Um, so with this uh, multidimensional scaling, um, it's doing the same thing where you've got like the most um, amount of di uh, variance explained in the x axis, second most in the y. And you can look at, you know, all of the, at the end of the day, you're just getting different um, ways to explain your data. Um, another one that I've seen, particularly in biostatistics, is um, the TSME. Um, it 
is again just another method to do it and you can also um it tries to keep the data as close like the structure of the data as close to the original um source as possible as opposed to like optimizing it to get the best reduction per se this is important if you need to um have data that you're not you don't want to manipulate the data as much to try to explain it like you really just want to look at it as it is um and if we you can see the plots here and i think this actually gives you the very best example um if you know compared to that first plot you've got five clearly distinct groups um that are clearly visible as opposed to like some of them being explained in one way and then some in another um so this data this is just another method to like really um look at the the variance but in a way that keeps your data um a little bit more intact in terms of like the um not so much the scale of the values but the um the if I said the information that they're telling you, it's like that doesn't really make much sense. But uh, essentially, just keeping um, the spirit of the data is also not the right word, but keeping it as untouched as possible in terms of how you're manipulating it. It's a little bit um, less. It's a little bit more raw, but sometimes that rawness can give you um, a cleaner separation than you would otherwise. So this is just another um, scaling method, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, what they do here too, they're just doing. Um, yeah, you're just. It's all just different methods in R. It's just you have your data set, and then it's just another method to apply it. Um, okay. Cool. And in the stat quest, I, I don't know if they do it in the tidy models. They probably explain it in the tidy models too. Um, but the um, the stat quest one, I know that has another video on like how TSNE is different from PCA. Um, and again, we'll be able to explain it better than I could attempt to do it. And it's like very clear examples. But yeah, to do all of these in R, it's really just a matter of just having, you know, the right, you know, if you have the package loaded with the analysis that you want to perform, um, it's really just a matter of, um, you know, using that package to just tell it to do that on your data frame. So, um, and then um, you can plot the results. Cool. Um, yeah. As far as like which one is used more, do you still see PCA being used more in bio? Yeah. Mathematics or um, yeah. Yeah, I, I see the yeah I see PCA the most. I do see some TSME essentially. PCA is always the default of like what you're going to try to do first, and then if you've got. I would then say it's probably the TSME is what I see the next most. I've never seen ICA used in the, at least in my field, I've never seen it used um, to go across to, I mean, and try to interpret grouping. Um, so yeah, I would say primarily PCA and then also TSME. Um, and it really cool. is just depending yeah. on the data set. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I did find the chapter four of the, working through some of the examples in the, um, the exercises for it. So um, we've got about 15 minutes left and we can work through um, some of that if y'all would like. I know uh, Lance, you said you wanted to see some of these examples and like how it's actually being done in R. Yeah, I would um, like that. So, yeah, absolutely. So um, we can go ahead and do that. So um, all of the data is in the package for the book. So I will go ahead and bring that in. I need to put in. We're not doing tidy. Okay. We'll run this and get our file. So that is up. And if we were to just look at our. We were to just look at the, the matrix. Whatever we're going to do later. All right. So the first example um, was really just scaling the data accordingly, and then making um, box plots of the the resulting data. So we'll go ahead and run that. So scaling it, um, the scale function um, 
it's just a matter of just calling the data set and, um, and running it. Oh, it says my screen is paused. Can y'all see my, um, the studio, the console? No, I just see the book. Ah, uh, okay. Zoom share. Oh, okay. I just sort of I have to change the screen that I'm doing this on. Okay. There we go. Yeah, there we go. All right. Um, yeah, so I, I went ahead and I imported the file um, and the libraries that we'll need for this. I mean, the packages that we'll need for this exercise. So going to here, I'm going to stop my share for a second and get a new share of my. And this way I should be able to jump back and forth between the. Um, the two. So the first thing we want to do is just scale the data and then also so scaling it will just reduce it to a single um I think what they they described it earlier in the book and they take the data and they um essentially reduce it so that way it all the values are between like zero and one. Um and then but you can also tell it to like take the log two instead of like log ten. So that's essentially what we were gonna do in this first step. And then we're gonna um plot the box plots real quick. So if we just did the general matrix box plot, you get um all this information, which this is not at all I mean it's very difficult to read. So if we scale it, um and a lot of this could also be you know affected by outliers. So if we do the initial box plot of the scaled data, um it evens things out. You still have a lot of um, outside points, um, outliers, uh, but you can see that the means in comparison to the first plot are a little bit um, more close, like it's, they're closer together and the spread is a little bit less. And then if we did the other scaled data, um, you have even less out, outside outliers um, and your means are all pretty closely centered together. Um, and then this would allow you to compare the minute differences between the different groups. Um, so that's the first example that we just wanted to do the scale and unscaled data. Um, so we want to use um, in the first example, I mean, the first uh, half of this chapter that we did last week, um, we were talking about the different types of distances like Euclidean versus Manhattan, and again, they're both useful to interpret the data. It's just a matter of like, it's up to us to be able to determine like which one best explains the differences. So it's not like you must use this to perform this analysis. It's like, okay, here are the tools at your disposal um, and figure out with those different ways how it's best explained. Um, so for this, um, they wanted to use um, a type of distance called the Ward D distance. Um, and I cannot off the top of my head explain what that is, but essentially it's just another method of calculating the distance between different points and then um, using that to perform the hierarchical clustering and plot a heat map. Um, so if we go back to the example, um, so we have our um, data frame. We're just going to plot two different, to do this against two different genes for the groups. Um, so the first method that we do is this is um, the non-scaled, the ward D distance. Um, this is unscaled data. And you can see that for the most part, these groups are pretty clearly um, separated. Um, you do have one of the CMLs grouping with the non-lymphoma, um, the not leukemia, group at all. Um, but you can clearly see um, differences between each of the groups and that the CML group looks pretty similar to the uh, non leukemic group. Um, but we can get a slightly different map if we change the method um, that we do the clustering in the way that the distance is calculated. So instead of doing the ward D2, we're doing the ward D here. Um, the clustering method and you, you know, it's subtle, but you do get slightly different um, groupings. Um, groupings are just the way that the expressions of the data are interpreted. So it's just another way of looking at it. Um, and then I thought this one looked 
the best. Um, what's the difference between the two groups? Yeah. So, uh, oh, yeah. So this was the matrix. The first two that I showed, these two are with the unscaled data. Um, and then if we do this again with the scaled data, um, you can start to see uh, the differences um, between the, the, A, the way that the samples are grouped together. Like this one, you've got very clear distinctions between all the five groups. You're not having the known schema group group with the schema group. Um, and yeah, you, I think because of that, this gives the best results. And again, it's just a matter of how you scaled your data beforehand. And this is the, so the X was just the regular scaling. This is the log two scale of the data with that heat map. Um, very, you know, different interpretation of it. The grouping is still um, distinct between the five groups, but in terms of the, um, the expression values of the data, you know, you get very different results. Um, so all of this is just to show that like there are multiple ways you can generate a heat map and that you, um, it, this is where the biological interpretation of it comes in. Okay, like which way really expresses, best explains the differences. Um, so that's the heat map example. Uh, the next thing they Great wanted question. to show, yep. I was just gonna ask, is there a, uh, when you're scaling your data, are there any tips or tricks that like prefer to scale one way versus another? Um, I don't really know. I don't think there necessarily is. Um, okay, so they say the standard dimension is the root mean square, um, where, but in terms of like how to scale it, um, it kind of depends on the type of data that you have. So um like for me i i do more like biological assays where i'm looking at um where i'd be diluting a sample um x number you know like doing like a tenfold dilution of something and so for me like scaling log logarithmic scaling could be really useful for that but if you're looking more at like just general full differences between groups um i think the standard method of just doing the root mean square would probably be okay. Um, again, I think it really just comes down to the type of data that you have, but there's no right or wrong way to scale. It just needs to be consistent, if that makes sense. Gotcha, yeah, cool. Yeah, cool, good deal. Um, all right, so going to the third example, um, the silhouette was, um, Something that we'll pop this real quick. Um, this is something that they use to determine the number of clusters to do. So all in this example, in the previous example, the number of clusters um, was determined just through the generation of the heat map. Um, but there are ways if you want to like break down the clusters. I mean, break like statistically determine the number of clusters. Um, to make. There are ways of doing that. Um, and one way they, in the example we did last week, that's something called like a silhouette plot. Um, I can't explain this that well, but essentially um, you're looking to see the number of clusters that are generated um, and what's going to give you um, the um, biggest difference essentially between the two different, between all of the clusters, like you're looking for the largest distance between them. Um, and so that's where this comes in with the um, silhouette plot and you're determining that the number of clusters here, like the five clusters gives you the biggest difference. So that's what you would pick. Um, what I found interesting was that even when you scale the data, um, uh, or like this is, this is an elbow plot. so here, um, uh, this is another interpretation of it where essentially with the crook in the elbow, um, the most amount of difference can be explained um, in the highest number of dimensions and that's what you want to choose because if you go down to five dimensions or five clusters, um, it doesn't 
you're not getting as good of a grouping as you could if you just had four dimension like four groups to cluster your data with so essentially like the way it was described is like like the crook of the elbow at that point is the number of clusters that you should have and it changes so here i did it um with the scaled data i mean the unscaled data if i were to use, use the scaled data so if i did this with x instead of the um which is the scaled data instead of the unscaled data you get a pretty similar plot um, and even if I change it to the uh, log scale data, um, you know, it's almost identical. So this tells me that we need just four clusters to be able to best explain this data. And, you know, compared to the so, heat map, yeah. Oh, I was just going to ask, um, uh, comparing this elbow plot to the silhouette uh, bar mm -hmm. plot that we had mm -hmm. um, before this. Um, yeah. Because I think here we were kind of saying like we want the most variance so we would say five clusters from is right. what we would choose from this plot but then the elbow plot is saying four right is that, yeah is that's that kind right. of how you would interpret yes um and i would go with the elbow plot as opposed to so because i think Again, I'm not entirely sure I'm explaining this correctly, but this is how I'm interpreting it. Is that like the silhouette is like, okay, like what do you need to get the the distance, like the most number of distance, and then the elbow plot is taking this data and actually showing, okay, like if you have the, like it, it's showing the average of this together um, gotcha. to explain okay. the the, this. Yeah. the elbow plot actually takes output from the silhouette. Right. right yeah right. okay cool yeah yeah and i'm not entirely sure i explained that totally correctly but that's how i'm interpreting it and i would i wouldn't use the silhouette data necessarily i would go with what the elbow plot had said and even with this too this is all kind of moot because at the same time um this is just like okay if you really want to be like this is how we determine the number of clusters to pick and we did perform this analysis it's also okay to be like okay we just tried this and this like how does it be? it's not rigid it's really just how can it be best explained and this is just one method to calculate you know based on the numbers alone this is how it's best explained um for the number of clusters to generate but again you have five groups um you've got five different types of cancer or five different four types of cancers and then the non-cancer groups so you've got five different groups so Ideally, you would want to see how all five of those are different, but this is essentially telling you it's like, no, one of those groups is similar to another group, and then the other three are then are distinct entities. So it's just, it's just a method of um, form, like a formally determining the number of clusters. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the... Yeah. Um, let's see what we got here. Letting the gap statistic. Um, again, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you what the gap statistic does. It's just another way of calculating um, cluster groups. Um, yeah, it's just it's another method of calculating this. And so for this graph. Um, the number of clusters you would want to have um, when this hits the point where it's um, essentially becoming like asymptotic, um, which here would be at about six, you're not really getting an increase of um, gaps after six dimensions. Um, that's the point that this would do. So, you know, compared to doing the silhouette plot and the um, elbow graph, um, this one's telling you six, the other one's telling you four. And again, this is where you have to know the type of data that you're working with to determine, okay, what makes the most sense. It would, you know, this to, would me, it would tell me that, okay, one of these groups likely has a, um, or like for AML, for example, there could be um, a subset with, you know, within AML, you might have two different types, like AML they may be able to be divided further into, you know, types of AML. And then the other groups are like that. You know, it's an interpretation that it, these are all just methods to explore the data, essentially. So it's just another way to think about how your data can be grouped. Um, 
So going on to the dimension um, ones. Um, so this is well, this example is we're going to do a um, PCA and then plot the screen plot and then how much of the um, components explain the most of the variation. Um, so we're plotting our matrix and we're doing the component analysis. Um, it just looks like confetti. It doesn't really tell you a whole lot. And if we go and were to do our uh, green plot of this, um, however, it's telling you that most of the variance is coming really from the first component. The second component's more, and then really once you get past um, three components, there's very little variation. So the variation um, can be explained essentially in one direction, in two directions. I mean, it's really explained in, I'd say, three directions, three components. Um, however, with this, th like, this doesn't really, to me, this doesn't tell you anything. Like, there's no um, separation in really any of the samples. Like, I couldn't draw any conclusions from this besides, but, like, it's all over the place. Um, this is all the data points together. So I then... Um, Did it again with just the um, I think just two genes, and this is where you start to see more of the um, this is the data of this the two genes, and you can start to see some groupings. Um, and then we're going to create um, a PCA of this data and scaling it, um, and then we'll do the screen plot of this, and you can still see that most of the um, components, it really just explained by the first dimension, not so much of the second dimension, um, which if you're looking at how the data are on the x-axis, you can see that um, you've got just a, a, a wider spread in the x. Um, so that is, that was example this is where I started to get a little lost and I wasn't really able to get this. But again, it's being able to do the PCA and getting the screen plot, I'd say, is probably the most useful lesson um, exercise from this chapter. Um, we did number six. Um, the PCA on the... I've actually got a drop soon, um, yeah. but um, is your R code, are you going to post it? Yeah, I'm going to post it, yeah. Okay, cool. It'll be on the, um, the over the weekend, I'll get the um, GitHub page, I mean, like the shared slides reloaded, and I'll make sure that my um, code is in the uh, folder as well. Cool, awesome. Yeah. Thanks, guys. I appreciate all yeah, this. Yeah, thanks. All right. Yeah, uh, thanks for coming on. Yeah, uh, hope to see you next time. Yeah, we'll see you. Bye. Okay. All right. Bye.